Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, all the news that's fit to hack. The New York Times is among the American newspapers blaming China for cyber attacks. Google makes a deal with another European government, this time it's France, over links to newspaper content in that country. We'll pay a visit to the morgue. That's what the rest of the newsroom calls the obituary desk. And as Oscar nominations go, this one's pretty dicey. But it's our web video of the week. When the New York Times announced January 30th that its computer systems had been hacked, it pointed an accusatory finger at Beijing. Not only did it say that hackers in China were responsible, the newspaper alleged that given the level of technical know-how, that the Chinese military could well have been involved. Beijing refuted that allegation. Then the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post also claimed that their systems had come under attack and again, hackers in China, again with alleged links to the government, topped the list of suspects. It is very hard to prove where cyber attacks originate, but in the case of China and the New York Times, what is not lacking is a motive. The Times infuriated Beijing last year with a piece of investigative reporting that revealed the $2.7 billion fortune amassed by the outgoing Chinese Premier, Wen Jiabao. Our starting point this week is cyberspace, which is looking like a battleground between media outlets in the West and a rising power in the Far East. Nobody, uh, no entity, private or public, is secure from cyber intrusions. They can affect entire systems and not be noticed at all. Unless the Chinese authorities give us access to those computers, we're never going to prove it definitely was state-sponsored. Unilateral blaming of another party without any conclusive evidence about it is actually counterproductive. On January 30th, the New York Times broke a story in which the newspaper claimed to be a victim. The story alleged that for the last four months, Chinese hackers have persistently attacked the New York Times, infiltrating its computer systems, and that the Times' security experts gathered digital evidence of methods associated with the Chinese military in the past. The next day, the Wall Street Journal reported that its computer systems had been infiltrated by Chinese hackers, apparently to monitor its China coverage. Two days later, it was the Washington Post, saying that it too had been targeted, and the paper quoted a security specialist it hired who said, the hackers want to know who the sources are, who in China is talking to the media. Three different newspapers, all among America's largest, all drawing the same conclusion, making the same allegation, that the hackers were in China and they were not working alone. The cybersecurity experts, um, through their ability to do forensics and look back, um, can determine the geographic location which the attacks come from. Attributing that to a specific individual, a government regime, is obviously more complicated. You can analyze the malware, the malicious software which is planted on the computer. And there's a number of clues that that malware may give us. For instance, you may be able to see uh, the server which it is uploading information to. You can look at the IP address and maybe work out the geographic location of that. But you could also look at the code and you could analyze whether the code, for instance, has been compiled in a programming language which has various bits set for Chinese language inside it. But what you're really looking at is what is the person after? What sort of information do they seek? If they had been going after information about as in this case, you find that what they seem to be going after is the contacts of people who've been writing stories about the wealth of Wei Jiabo and the Chinese Premier and the people in power in China, then you start to think that these are possibly people who want to know where this information is coming from. It's really much more about uh, deductive logic rather than actually finding a smoking gun. The New York Times says its systems have been targeted for the past four months. That would put the start of the hacking at roughly the same time the paper revealed that China's former premier, Wen Jiabao, and his family held assets worth close to $3 billion. The Chinese government is on record as denying any involvement in the cyber attacks, as are its proxies. I don't think uh, it is uh, scientifically uh, verified 
that the attacks uh, were launched uh, from China. Uh, however, I would emphasize that if the Americans do have the evidence, we hope there will be a good channel of communication so that different parties can bring evidences together onto the same table and let's sit down and really talk about it, re really do all the verification and try to come up with a solution. Access to personal As is often the case in the coverage of news, a story where the evidence is thin quickly grows thick with speculation. We talk about you know tens of thousands of viruses being discovered every year. That's just the tip of the iceberg. In the absence of facts, theories abound. Here are two of them. I think actually it's very convenient to use the excuse of, oh, this must have been a state-sponsored attack. Because if I ran a company and my company got hacked, I'm not going to be in as much trouble with my bosses if I say, well, this was so sophisticated, this wasn't normal hackers, this was another country breaking into our computers. We're saying it can't have been kids in their back bedrooms. But the truth is, there are lots of very sophisticated amateur hackers out there as well. And so it could just as equally be a patriotic Chinese student in his flat with an internet connection deciding he wants to break into the New York Times. If there are people among the Chinese population who are very skilled uh, at using computers and breaking into remote systems, usually they would be more like the sort of anonymous collective. So um, the feeling is very much that they're further up the scale. For the commercial hacker, you know, the sort of person who writes the banking Trojan malware as it's known, What's, what's the benefit? Where's the commercial benefit in being able to find sources for a New York Times reporter? There's really nothing you can do. You can't sell it on the open market. So if you rule out the lower level because they just don't have the ability, and if you rule out the middle level because they don't have the interest, then that leaves you with the higher level because they have both the ability and the interest. This is a news story that is about more than just China and its dealings, real or imagined, with major American newspapers. It's a story about a time-worn journalistic imperative, one that still pertains in this electronic age, as it always will. It's about the protection of sources. We all need to, particularly journalists, who believe, rightly so, that it's critically important to keep their identity of their sources secret, need to think twice about communicating through email. Going back to maybe a slower way of doing business, a more a difficult way, but writing down names and sources and your stories and keeping it you know, locked away in a drawer until you're ready to release it may be a way to go depending on the nature and the sensitivity of, uh, of that article and how well you want to protect it um, before releasing it to the public and how well you want to protect the identity of your sources. Traditionally, financial institutions have been taking computer security very seriously and maybe media organizations haven't been taking it quite as seriously because they've had less to lose. They think, well, how can we lose money from this sort of thing, unlike banks? But the truth is, of course, that news agencies have information, and not all of it is stuff that they want to print in the newspapers. And if you're working on a sensitive story, a sensitive political story, then you don't necessarily want your enemies being able to find out who your contacts are and read your private emails. So I think news agencies are going to have to take computer security just as seriously as financial organizations, which means a layered defense, which means encrypting your sensitive information, and they need to learn that lesson. Our Global Village Voice is now on cyber warfare and the news business. These hacks at the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, well, they're nothing really new. Media companies just need to expect it to keep happening and they need to expect them to become more intense. Both media companies and antivirus companies need to work together, really. They need to lock down the network, restrict access as much as humanly possible. This is only going to get worse. And I think the media companies and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times are just the beginning. What I think media companies really have to fear about hacking is just the fact that their notes or their data could be compromised or deleted, especially if it's notes or data that could be considered too unflattering to the specific country that is targeting their notes. For example, if China felt that what Al Jazeera was reporting or in, you know, for the US, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal was reporting, they could just go into that computer, delete those notes, those very crucial notes, and uh, audio clips as well, because that is that is a journalist's life and blood. 
Time now for Listening Post News Bites. Google has shelled out 60 million euros to the French government. It's the price the search giant is paying to stave off the passage of a new law that would have forced Google to pay a special tax for the right to link to French publications through its Google News service. The idea behind the so-called link tax was to have Google share its revenues with French newspapers and magazines which are struggling to make money online. The deal was signed by Google's CEO Eric Schmidt and French President François Hollande on February 1st. Some commentators are accusing the company of blackmail after it threatened to drop French content from its servers. Google has also been under fire in France for tax avoidance, which is a touchy issue these days because of the new tax regime imposed by the Hollande government that has wealthy French citizens paying tax at significantly higher rates. Google had already reached a link tax deal with the Belgian government and the Merkel government in Germany is also reported to be looking at a similar tax. A Greek magazine has accused an oil magnate of threatening its staff after it reported on the industry's modus operandi. The latest edition of a monthly magazine called Unfollow featured a piece about Dimitris Melissanidis and an oil company called Aegean Oil. According to the magazine, a day after publication, the journalist behind the piece, Leftidis Cheralampopoulos, got a threatening phone call from a man identifying himself as Melisanidis. During the conversation, the caller is alleged to have threatened the reporter with legal action and worse, reportedly saying, you will not be able to sleep, you will not be able to go out, I'll be your nightmare. Fear of me will haunt you. They will come to your house and blow you up in your sleep. I looked you up and I will tear you down. The magazine said it traced the number back to Melisanidis' office, but Melisanidis has denied the accusation and called on the magazine to publish the denial on its website. Greek journalists say that they're in tough when trying to report freely these days. Just last month, the homes of five journalists were firebombed by Greeks apparently unhappy with coverage of the economic crisis. The Greek journalists' union, Eshia, condemned the trend. It said the state must immediately move drastically and take effective measures to protect journalists before it's too late. The challenge facing reporters in Somalia is a story we keep coming back to, and it's not just journalists targeted by the gun. On February the 5th, a court in Mogadishu sentenced freelance journalist Abdi Aziz Ibrahim to a year in jail for insulting the state. Ibrahim was arrested last month after he interviewed a woman who alleged she had been gang raped last year by Somali security forces. Ibrahim, the woman and two others were arrested shortly thereafter on charges that included making false claims. The woman was also sentenced to one year in prison. Ibrahim's interview was never actually published. However, prosecutors claim it was used in this report by Al Jazeera, which the network has denied. Critics of the government are saying this case is politically motivated and designed to stifle unfavorable reporting on the country's security forces. Daniel Bekele, the Africa director at the U.S.-based Human Rights Watch organization, said the case was built on groundless charges and serious due process violations and should have been thrown out. The government should swiftly move to exonerate and release the defendants. Somalia is one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a journalist. The country ranks fifth from the bottom in the latest Reporters Without Borders Press Freedom Index. A bizarre new video has emerged from North Korea, the stuff apparently of which dreams are made in Pyongyang. The three-minute video was released by the state's official propaganda website, which is called Uri Minzokiri, and it was also posted on YouTube. It begins with a man in bed dreaming about the future of North Korea's missile program. As the music, We Are the World, builds, missile launches are cut into sequences showing euphoric North Koreans. Then the missiles hit a city that looks like New York, which is engulfed in flames. The text on the screen says, I see black smoke rising somewhere in America. It appears that the headquarters of evil, which has had a habit of committing wars of aggression, is going up in flames. It itself has ignited. They call it working in the morgue, working at the one desk in the newsroom that editors check in with whenever somebody famous checks out. We're talking about the newspaper's obituary desk. Those extended obits don't get written after somebody dies, they're already on file. The obit desk is supposed to have them ready at a moment's notice. And it's not as though the only obits ready to go are about elderly newsmakers. It doesn't matter how old you are. A good obit editor is supposed to be prepared for anything. The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now on the art of the obituary, the do's and don'ts of the craft. 
It's journalism's open, morbid secret that news organizations around the world have thousands of pre-written obituaries on file, just waiting for when the time comes. Preparation is key in obits, and so we do have many, many obituaries, uh, at least in some stage of, of pre-writing. We do try to write as many as we can in advance. Uh, we have right now about 1,500 on file. You keep trying to stay ahead of Father Time, and you can't. Uh, people are, are going to die at most unexpected times. What happens often, though, is people themselves or their friends, you know, and loved ones will contact us and say, my father or, you know, this colleague is not well, you might want to prepare something. So it's usually a basis of negotiation, but it would be very rare for us to r ring up, you know, one half of a couple and say, I hear your husband's not very well, uh, <laughs> can we have a quick chat? The people who go into our morgue, as we call it, never seem to die. We've had Nelson Mandela in there for ages, we've had Castro in there. I find that if you do an obit in advance, it's a guarantee of eternal life. The advantage of having pre-written obituaries on file is that news organizations can publish them quickly and accurately, or so they hope. That wasn't the case for the New York Times. When American news anchor Walter Cronkite died in 2009, the newspaper's report needed seven corrections after publication, an obituary-related record for the 161-year-old paper. Still, pre-written obituaries are common practice for Western news organizations, but in certain parts of the Arab world, being prepared could land an obituary writer in trouble. For the last 50, 60 years, there were dictatorships, and dictatorships, actually, death is not on the card. There's no process of succession when the dictator dies, therefore they don't think about it. And because most of the newspapers, they have very strong censorship, the intelligence services or the security service will be having spies there. So anyone suggests that the leader might die, let's actually keep it on file, is a taboo. After the 9-11 attacks, President George W. Bush made the fate of Osama bin Laden pretty clear. He said, wanted, dead or alive. So when President Obama announced that the leader of Al-Qaeda had been killed, it's unlikely there was an obituaries editor in the world who hadn't given some thought to what they would say about the man. We started writing it right after 9-11. And by some strange intuition, I can't tell you, but two or three weeks before he actually was killed, it got into my mind that I should maybe look at this one with no, no advanced information. It's what I do. I have to think about people like this. We were fortunate to have something substantially ready like that. We had about 5,000 word obit all ready to go. Of course he was in hiding. He really wasn't doing a lot for the last years of his life, which for an obituary editor it helps you to relax. You didn't have to change his obituary for years. You just then had to add the circumstances and the nature of his death, a couple of paragraphs at the end of the piece, read it through and pretty much you hoped you were there. I got into quite a bit of trouble because I insisted on finding out about the life of the man. I talked about his love of eating yogurt and honey and how he would take his children to the beach and how he would go hunting on Fridays on a horse. And um, the Americans among our readers were furious about this and said, you should just have condemned him. Why are you trying to tell us these things about him? This man is just a monster. Pre-writing the obituary of someone who spent 12 years on the FBI's most wanted list is one thing. But it's something else entirely when your subject is a pop star and is just 26 years old. In 2008, it emerged that the Associated Press had prepared an obituary for the then-troubled American singer Britney Spears. The news caused quite a stir. I think it's rather bad form to make that public. I dare say there are, there are many, many people alive who've got their obits on file and quite a lot of young ones too. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but I think it's bad form and bad taste to announce it with someone like Amy Winehouse, who I mean, perhaps the equivalent situation of a young pop star who had troubles um, with, with addictions, that it would have been very unlikely that my colleagues in other papers didn't have an obituary prepared. Is that callous or is that just being reasonable and prepared for our jobs? I wouldn't announce it, but it would be no surprise to me if many other young troubled stars have prepared obits. Dealing with an untimely death is a sensitive issue, but so is characterizing an unscrupulously lived life, which is why obituary writers tend to write in code 
and readers need to read between the lines. Euphemisms in, in obituaries is a traditional part of the way we write, um, has been for a long time, and so classically people would say, oh, he was a bon vivant when he was a terrible drunk, or didn't take fools gladly when he was an absolute beast. So the point of obituaries is that they're not anodyne tributes, constantly writing about the good side of people. You have to give readers an idea of whether someone's nice or nasty and give them an, a sense of the, the rough with the smooth and uh, euphemisms have been about that. When Lucy and Freud, the artist, died, this is not quite a euphemism but it made me laugh. The obituary ended up, he left many children. Now, usually an obituary ends up by saying he leaves, you know, a widow and two daughters or three sons. But of course, Lucian Freud was a well-known philanderer and had multiple mistresses. So this was a way of making the same point again in the last line of the obituary is a very neat little remark. Euphemisms may help to convey character flaws to the reader, but they don't change the fact that the writer has to deal with death on a daily basis. But it's not as macabre as it may appear. Quite a lot of obituaries uh, are uh, colorfully written and you have quite sort of sometimes um, the amusing part of it. Nowadays, with newspaper actually competing with tabloids, you have to inject a bit of humor, even in an obituary. We really uh, don't dwell on their deaths. The deaths is the news peg, you might say, and uh, it really comprises one paragraph, perhaps maybe more, in a story. Uh, we're mainly interested in talking about their lives. We are dealing with the achievements that those people have made during the course of their lives. And that is very uplifting. It may be the last word on a life, but it's the start of a legacy. And the next time you flip to the obituaries page of your newspaper, that's worth remembering. More Global Village Voice is now on the delicate art of obituary writing. All pre-written obituaries need to be protected. Why? Well, there's always the danger that they could be released early, before the individual's death. This has happened in a number of cases. If you'll think back, you probably remember that Bob Hope's obituary was released before his death. Had everybody all in an uproar, and all of a sudden someone checked and said, no, he's still in the hospital, he's not dead. Social media offer the capability and the expectation that news, like obituaries, will be instantaneous. So now there's even more of a need that obituaries be well written and prepared and ready in advance because we can be informed when we read an accurate obituary. But even more than that, we can be inspired when we read an obituary that is a compelling story of a life. Finally, one of the best things about looking for the videos that end our program is that no longer do the big Hollywood studios have a monopoly on high quality animation. Much of today's top talent lives on YouTube. We've been watching an eye-catching stop-motion short called Fresh Guacamole by director Adam Pesapane. This animation amassed 3.5 million hits in its first four days online, and it's been nominated for an Academy Award for Best Animated Short Film. At 1 minute 41 seconds, it's the shortest film ever nominated for an Oscar, and it will appeal to foodies and gamblers alike. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post.